So we began a new year, a new decade, a new season of ministry, which brings us to a new sermon series for 2020. And that, of course, is the book of Ecclesiastes. The Lord has placed on my heart to share with you, to challenge you, as it will challenge me as we get into the book of Ecclesiastes, and we're going to be in Ecclesiastes all the way up to Palm Sunday. And so we're going to spend uh, quite a few weeks studying the book of Ecclesiastes. And this is my prayer, is that as we go through this book, it will, it will help you in that next step in, in your life. As we look to this book, this book will challenge us in many areas of life as well as ministry. And I am so looking forward to uh, just getting into this and, again, challenging you as much as it's going to challenge me. And so, as always, as we begin a new sermon series, especially where it concerns a book or a letter, uh, I like using the the 5W1H method of Bible study, that is the who, what, where, why, when, and of course how, when it comes to the Bible, when it comes to studying the Word of God, you, you want to approach it asking these kind of questions as to who, uh, who, who's the author of, of the book or the letter, uh, what is the, really the key text, and uh, what is the message, the key message for uh, this particular book or letter. And, of course, uh, getting that good historical background of when and where uh, they were when this book was written. And, of course, the important part uh, of uh, understanding why it was written and then come going to how. How can I apply? Once I've gathered all this information regarding a certain book or letter of the Bible, and as I've gathered all this and, and understand this and interpret it uh, uh, and, uh, correctly, how am I going to apply it? So you ask that very important question, Lord, what are you saying to me in this message, in this study? How can I make this applicable to my life? And so as we open up Ecclesiastes, we ask that very important question, of course, as to who is the author, who is the author of uh, Ecclesiastes. Now, it's been hotly debated amongst many scholars and theologians, but uh, most believe that it was King Solomon who wrote Ecclesiastes. I believe as well that King Solomon is the author of the book of Ecclesiastes, and and he wrote this during the latter years of his life, while he was still reigning as king of Israel. He writes the book of Ecclesiastes. And I'm going to be sharing with you information from a lot of great uh, commentaries and, and theologians, and uh, uh, such as uh, Dr. David Jeremiah, uh, Dr. Bob Rickers, uh, Dr. Uh, Tony Evans, of course, uh, one of my favorite, J. Vernon McGee, Warren Worsby, uh, and of course, Charles Spurgeon. And as I gather all this information regarding Ecclesiastes, we're going to really, really delve into to, uh, what this book is saying to us. And so when we talk about the who or the author of this, Dr. David Jeremiah says, from a human perspective, the two wisest men in history, certainly two of the best teachers, were Jesus of Nazareth and Solomon, king of Israel. But if the two traveled the same road in terms of skill, their paths diverged at crossroads called integrity. Jesus never lost his pure perspective, willingly facing death for what he knew to be true. Solomon, on the other hand, began swagging his kingdom or swapping his kingdom colored glasses for lenses shaded with cynicism and doubt in the latter half of his life. I love what 
pastor author Dr. Bob Rickers had to say about this, and I'm quoting from uh, one of his books, A Time for Every Purpose. And here's what Dr. Rickers had to say regarding King Solomon. He writes, King Solomon was a realist. In fact, I would even call him a realist, realist. It's interesting. He writes with candor about frustration, fulfillment, work, sex, injustice, friendship, worship, happiness, insecurity, suffering, temptation, folly, confusion, emptiness, and of course, our concerns. Even most importantly, he writes about those topics with a kind of brutal honesty and unsentimental clarity that even today few would dare to express in a religious book. And boy, you're going to see that as we get into these 12 chapters. Dr. Tony Evans had this to say. It was written by a very wealthy and wise man who described life as a puzzle he couldn't quite put together despite his vast riches and wisdom. So he want, went on a pilgrimage to find out the meaning of life, taking his readers along on his binges of the pleasures of the flesh, the accumulation of wealth, and the reality of death. He discovered that living independently of God was trying to pursue the wind or grasp at the wind. Again, many scholars believe that Solomon wrote Ecclesiastes in his mature years while he was still reigning in Israel. We're going to learn more about the author as we continue on into this study. But what is the book actually saying to us? Again, sharing some information from Dr. Bob Rickers. He shares that Ecclesiastes is also a book about wisdom. Solomon writes, we need two kinds of wisdom. The wisdom that tells us how to get things done in this world, practical wisdom. The second type of wisdom is God's wisdom. This spiritual wisdom tells us what is eternally important. And that is so, so true when we study the book of Ecclesiastes. And of course, as we look at these 12 chapters, we're going to see words and phrases that are repeated throughout these 12 chapters, such as the word vanity or vanities. That word is mentioned 35 times throughout these 12 chapters. The word means vapor or breath, something elusive, something you cannot grasp. You cannot get a hold of breath or vapor, meaningless. You're going to see the repeated phrase throughout these 12 chapters, under the sun. Under the sun is used 29 times throughout these 12 chapters. Under the sun is referring to here on earth. So when we read, there is nothing new under the sun, he's simply saying, been there, done that. There's really nothing new. And everything that I have experienced, I want you to know, I've been there and I've done that. When was this book written? Written around 935 B.C., during the latter years of King Solomon's life. Why is that so important? Well, it is important because whenever we study the Word of God, as you've heard me, heard me share many times before, we got to understand that during that time, where they were, the culture, and all those things that play a tremendous role in studying God's Word. Now, even though it was written around 935 B.C., that does not mean it is not applicable to us in the year 2020. Amen? Because we know that the Word of God tells us in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, that the Word of God is quick. What does it mean? It means it's alive. It's powerful. It's active. It's relevant. 
God's word deals with you right where you are today. So even though Ecclesiastes was written in 935 B.C., it's relevant for January 5th, 2020. Amen? And of course, he was in Jerusalem when he wrote this book. And that's, of course, we find that, that in the first chapter. Now we come to why. Why did the Lord lay it, lay it on Solomon's heart to pin down these words? Well, again, quoting from Dr. Bob Rickers, Solomon wanted, Solomon wanted to paint a picture of the truth that all could see in his day and in ours. He wanted everyone to know exactly what life holds for the person who has no use for God or who talks as if he does but ignores him. He also wanted everyone to know exactly what life will be like for those who love the Lord, learn justice and mercy, and walk humbly before God. No sentiment, no punches pulled, just the truth. I love that. And Solomon is, is wanting us to know that even though I've been there and I've done that, I got to share some things with you about life. Which brings us to how. So let us look into Ecclesiastes chapter 1. And these 18 verses is really going to set us up for what Solomon is going to say in these next few chapters. Again, and we're going to be in this all the way up to Palm Sunday. Ecclesiastes, chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. These are the words of the teacher or preacher, King David's son who ruled in Jerusalem. Everything is meaningless. And of course, I'm, I'm reading from the New Living Translation, but uh, other trans, uh, other. Um, Bibles have vanity, vanity and vexation of spirit. So he's, he's saying that everything is vanity. Everything is, va everything is meaningless, says the teacher, completely meaningless. What do people get for all their hard work under the sun? So as you work your behind off, what do you get for that? You work hard here on earth. What do you get for that? Verse 4, generations come and generations go, but the earth never changes. The sun rises and the sun sets, then hurries around to rise again. The wind blows south and then turns north. Around and around it goes, blowing in circles. Rivers run into the sea, but the sea is never full. The water returns again to the rivers and flows out again to the sea. Everything is wearisome beyond description. No matter how much we see, we are never satisfied. Boy, isn't that interesting. No matter how much we hear, we are not content. History merely repeats itself. It has all been done before. Nothing under the sun is truly new. Been there, done that. Verse 10, sometimes people say, here is something new, but actually it is old. Nothing is ever truly new. We don't remember what happened in the past and in the future generations. No one will remember what we are doing now. I, the teacher or the preacher, was king of Israel and I lived in Jerusalem. I devoted myself to search for understanding and to explore by wisdom everything being done under heaven. I soon discovered that God has dealt a tragic existence to the human race. Boy, 
you talk about a dude that is just, I mean, in his own mind, he's thinking like, wow, why, why even live? I observed everything going on under the sun, and really, it is all vanity or meaningless, like chasing the wind. What is wrong cannot be made right. What is missing cannot be recovered. I said to myself, look, I am wiser than any of the kings who ruled in Jerusalem before me. I have greater wisdom and knowledge than any of them. So I set out to learn everything from wisdom to madness and folly. But I learned firsthand that pursuing all this is like chasing the wind. The greater my wisdom, the greater my grief. To increase knowledge only increases sorrow. Now, before we go to that last verse, let us just think about these 18 verses. Sounds like he, he had, the, I mean, he was cynical. Depressed, as my brother just said. But now, understanding his position, and we're going to get into that next Sunday as we, we open up chapter 2 in the pursuit of happiness. But as he opens up this book and his thoughts on everything is meaningless, I mean, nothing's new, nothing changes, everything just remains the same. And no matter how much wisdom you may have, and I, I was the wisest of all. And yet, I found myself chasing the wind. Chasing after something that I can't even grasp. Trying to hold on to something that I can't even hold on to. I can't, I, it's meaningless. And so before we go to this last verse for today, I, let, let me just ask you this question. Have you ever felt that way as Solomon has shared with us? Have you ever felt like, man, oh man, what is life for? I mean, everything is the same. Every day is the same. Nothing's new. We try to, to do something new and refreshing at, at, at the beginning of, of each year. We make our resolutions. We try to start afresh. Only to find that as the years go on, as the year goes on, <laughs> nothing's new. Which is why we, we move around and, 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 and we get so tired of things and, and, and we get tired of our, 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 our possessions that we got to have something new. We get tired of our old clothes. We get new clothes. We get tired of our old, old automobiles. We get new automobiles. We get tired of our old homes. And we get new homes, furniture, whatever the case may be, even mates. I need me a new man. I need me a new woman. I'm just going, that's not me, okay? <laughs> Amen. We just celebrated 38 years and looking forward to many, many more. So everything is good in the Bradford home. Amen. <laughs> boy, I get my wife to speak up like that, boy. <laughs> but now let's look at this very last verse, and of course, it's at the end of Ecclesiastes chapter 12. And so this is our application verse. 
So as we get into this sermon series, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, when it's all said and done, as Solomon has shared with us everything that he's done under the sun, here is what I want us to take away from what we're going to study. And I will be sharing this throughout the sermon series because this is the key verse of Ecclesiastes. In all of Ecclesiastes, chapter 12, verse 13 is the key verse where Solomon says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. So take into consideration everything that I've shared with you from chapter 1 all the way up to chapter 12. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God. Stop right there. Now, here's where, Bible students, you really need to understand the importance of word study. Fear. The Greek word, or the Hebrew word, word rather, is yare. Another word that we see for fear is reverend. Write down a cross-reference, Psalm 111, verse 9. And it talks about the name of God is fearsome, fearful, reverend. Solomon is saying, let us hear the conclusion of this whole matter, of the whole matter, revere God, reverence God, fear God. Now that fear is a fear that you and I can relate with. It is a fearful, it is a being afraid. It is that kind of fear. And why is he saying that? Well, if you know God, if you know the true God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, if you read throughout the Old Testament, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and understanding that the teacher, the preacher, is writing to this audience, who understood back then what that Shekinah glory was all about. That knew that when, when God spoke and the earth shook and there was thunder to where they said to Moses, you speak to us. Please, you speak to us. We are fearful of God speaking because his voice just brought fear which made them fear him, reverence him. And Solomon is saying when it's all said and done wanting you to know that I have been there, I've done that Here's my conclusion. Reverence God. Fear him. And keep his, what church? Commandments. Again, a, a word that really don't resonate with 21st century Americans. I mean, we know about the Ten Commandments, which ended up being 600 and something more commandments. But when you're talking about a Jewish people that knew that they were given that covenant and the commandments, the law, 
And as Solomon is writing to this audience, and of course he's writing to an audience just before the two kingdoms were to split, caused by his son Rehoboam, of course. But they're still together as one nation. And as he's addressing them, he's saying, guys, one thing that I want you to take away from everything that I've shared with you, fear God. Reverence him and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. You want to know what your duty is, your, what your responsibility is? Fear God. And keep his commandments. I'm here to share with you about your life and where you are right now here in 2020. I'm here to share with you about your ministry. And how that you can make this applicable to your life. There may be someone here that don't know God, don't fear God, have no knowledge of God whatsoever. Well, I pray that God the Holy Spirit will prick your hearts right now. And understand that this is not something that we just do. We take what thus saith the Lord very seriously. And Solomon is going to teach us the importance of our walk with the Lord. And if you don't know him, not know of him, but know him in a personal way, I pray that somehow, some way, that you will be led to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Because when it's all said and done, when we fear God and keep his commandments and understanding what that means as we go throughout this book, and I'm so, so thankful that, that I have these great men that, that I'm going to be leaning on and, and gathering this information to challenge us. Ecclesiastes is a very challenging book. But boy, when it's all said and done, it's real, it's raw. As Dr. Bob Ricker said, it's, it's the truth. Fear God, keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. And so as we prepare to leave here today, let us understand that last verse. And let's focus on the how. How am I? If you're a Christ follower, ask yourself this question. Lord, what are you saying to me right now? What message do I take away? How are you challenging me in what you say? to fear you, to keep your commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. Lord, do I fear you? Am I in awe, which is another word for yare? Awe. Am I in awe? Of you. Do I reverence him that much to there to where I know 
that I am in the presence of all. That is what it means to know him. That statement that we have up on the wall is not just something that we just threw out there. I truly want you to know God and follow him through faith in Jesus Christ. I want you to fear him as I fear him. I want you to understand that you are in his presence because he is a omnipresent God. Amen? He is a God that is omnipotent, which means what, church? All power. He is a God that is omniscient, which means what, church? All knowing. And when I understand that, I understand that I'm to fear him. Do you fear him? And if you fear him, you will, trust me, keep his commandments. If you fear him, trust me, you will understand that that is your duty. So as I'm going to challenge myself in this sermon series, I'm challenging you. Take away from this today, Ecclesiastes 12, 13. Fear God. Keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. And for those of you who don't know Christ, who don't know God through Christ, I pray that you will come to know him. Because when it's all said and done, church, and and. And as, as Solomon says, there, there is nothing new, but the Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away and all things become new. Now, that's not contradicting what Solomon said. And we're going to get into that starting next Sunday as we open up chapter 2. Let's pray. Father. Lord, this is going to be a very challenging sermon series. A lot of things that we're going to read in the book of Ecclesiastes will not make sense to us from a human perspective. But from a spiritual perspective, Father, we know that as the Holy Spirit laid upon Solomon's heart, to share with us these words and how that we are to apply them, to challenge us, to let us know what life is all about, to challenge us in ministry, wow. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father, for these great authors, commentators, theologians who have poured and poured into their studies to share with us what Ecclesiastes is all about. May we leave here today, Father, prepared to study this great book from a great wise man led by the Holy Spirit. And Father, I pray 
for those that may not know you, that there was something said and shared today, Father, that will just want them to make a decision today. To not just know of you, but to know you in a personal way through Jesus Christ. That they too may understand what it means to fear you, to reverence you. Because you're an awesome God. You're also a loving God. A God who loved us so much that he gave. You gave your only begotten son. Your son who loved us so much that he died for us. Who loved us so much that when he left, he said, I would not leave you comfortless. I will send another helper. He will be with you. He will dwell in you. He is the Holy Spirit. Thank you for loving us so much that our bodies are now the temple of the Holy Spirit. I pray, Father, for those individuals that may want to make a decision today to come forward and talk about it, pray about it, and be welcomed into your kingdom. For those of us, Father, who know you, those of us who are struggling in life, struggling in ministry, may we learn from Solomon. the importance of fearing you and keeping your commandments. Thank you, Father. Thank you for this congregation. Thank you for the worshipers today. And may we leave here today continuing to worship you in spirit and in truth. And I pray this in the mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And God's people said... Amen.